Today's video is brought to you by Slide Belts, creators of high quality belts featuring unique ratcheting buckles. Not only do they make my personal favorite belt, the survival belt, but they're also longtime viewers of the channel. I've personally used slide belts for some time now and honestly, they make a fantastic product. It also makes a great gift since you can buy one size and trim it to fit. Be sure to stick around to the end of the video for a special discount code for my viewers, redeemable at slidebelts.com. He is the heir of Isildur, chieftain of the Dúnedain, and destined to reunite the great kingdoms of men. After a traumatic childhood, decades of wilderness and war, and finally reclaiming the throne, he would go on to serve his realm in his second century of life. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the complete travels of Aragorn. Aragorn II is born on March 1st, 2931 of the Third Age, to his father, Arathorn II, and mother, Gilrain. Gilrain's mother, Ivorwen, had convinced her husband to allow the marriage despite his objections. With her gift of foresight, she had proclaimed that from their marriage, hope might be born for the Dúnedain, and that their son would one day wear a green stone upon his breast. When Aragorn is just two years old, his father is killed, shot in the eye by an orc arrow. Gilrain takes her son to Rivendell to be fostered by Elrond. Over the years, this had become a custom for the heirs of Isildur to be fostered in Rivendell for a time. With his father slain, Elrond would care for Aragorn as if he were his own son. For the child's safety, Elrond would keep his identity a secret, instead calling him Estelle, the Sindarin word for hope. In his early years, Estelle would often go on journeys with Elrond's twin sons, Eladan and Elrohir. The twins had also, years earlier, been on the hunt with Arathorn when he was killed. In 2952, when Estelle is around 20 years old, he returns to Rivendell from a journey of great deeds with Eladan and Elrohir. Elrond is pleased to see that Estelle has grown to be both fair and noble, and that he was coming to manhood early. Thus, Elrond reveals to Estelle his true name, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, heir of Isildur. Elrond presents to him the heirlooms of the Dúnedain of the North, the shards of Narsil, and the ring of Barahir. There is one final heirloom, the scepter of Anuminas, the original capital of the Northern Kingdom of Arnor, established by Elendil himself. Elrond withholds the scepter from Aragorn, saying he must first earn it. The following day, Aragorn is walking alone in the woods at sunset. His heart is full of hope, and he begins to sing the Lay of Luthien, the very song Aragorn sings in the Fellowship of the Ring film. As he wanders in the woods, he comes across an elf maiden, and to Aragorn she seems as Luthien herself, widely known to be the most beautiful person to have ever lived. Fearing that she would leave, and he would never see her again, he calls to her, Tenuviel, Tenuviel, just as Baron had done when he first met Luthien. The elf corrects him, for she is not Luthien reborn, but Arwen, daughter of Elrond. She had just returned from a long visit in Lorien with her grandparents, Galadriel and Celeborn. Aragorn, who had just learned of his high lineage, feels as though it is nothing compared to her dignity and loveliness. We are told that Gilrain opposes the idea of Aragorn and Arwen being together, for she believes Arwen's lineage is more noble and that elves and men should not intermarry. Ironically, both Aragorn and Arwen are descended from two such unions, Beren and Luthien and Tuor and Idril. Likewise, Elrond would learn of Aragorn's love for his daughter, not from Gilrain or from Arwen, but he says he can see the truth in Aragorn's eyes. He summons Aragorn and tells him, a great doom awaits you, either to rise above the height of all your fathers since the days of Elendil, or to fall into darkness with all that is left of your kin. Many years of trial lie before you. You shall neither have wife nor bind any woman to you in troth until your time comes and you are found worthy of it. 
Elrond says the future will bring what it may, and that they will not speak of this topic for many years, and that days of darkness lie ahead. Aragorn lovingly takes his leave of Elrond. He bids farewell to his mother, the house of Elrond, and to Arwen, and goes into the wild. Aragorn takes up his mantle as 16th Chieftain of the Dúnedain, and in 2956 of the Third Age, meets Gandalf the Grey for the first time. The two would go on to become great friends. It is Gandalf who advises Aragorn to keep watch over the region of the Shire, where he would become known as Strider. From 2957 to 2980, Aragorn goes on many great journeys, aiding the men of the West against Sauron. So as not to reveal his identity, he goes by the name of Thorongil, a name Gondorians called him meaning Eagle of the Star, for he wore a silver star upon his cloak and was known for being keen-eyed. He would first come to Rohan, where he would serve under King Thengil, the father of Theoden. Thorongil would ride with the Rohirrim for some time, until hearing a summons from Gondor, requesting aid of any men who are willing. He travels to Minas Tirith, coming to serve the steward Ecthelion II, father of Denethor. Thorongil's arrival, and his deeds on both land and sea, would cause a rift with Denethor, for it is said that Ecthelion trusted and loved Thorongil most. Among Thorongil's counsels to the steward is that he should not trust the wizard Saruman, but instead Gandalf the Grey. This was in opposition to Denethor, who did not trust Mithrandir. Not only was it so with his father, but Denethor also finds himself placed second to Thorongil in the hearts of the men of Gondor as well, bringing about a resentment that would last for decades to come. While Thorongil is known for great deeds and leadership during his time in Gondor, we are only told of one particular battle in 2980, his last in Gondor for many long years. Ecthelion had been anticipating an attack from Sauron, for it had been nearly 30 years since Sauron had declared himself openly once again in Mordor, and it was only a matter of time until he moved against his closest neighbor. Thorongil counsels the steward, saying the Corsairs of Umbar would wreak havoc upon the southern fiefs should Sauron move against them. Ecthelion gives Thorongil leave to take some Gondorian vessels south in an attempt to deal with this great threat. Thorongil leads the navy to the Gulf of Umbar, catching the Corsairs by surprise. They burn and destroy many Corsair ships, and Thorongil himself kills the captain of the Haven of Umbar in battle. He then withdraws his forces, having suffered only a few losses. Thanks to this attack, the threat of Umbar would be diminished for several years, protecting Gondor from naval attack. Though he would be honored greatly for his deeds should he return to Gondor, Thorongil leaves his men when they stop at Pelargir. He sends word to Ecthelion that other tasks now called to him. The last his men would see of Thorongil is him heading toward the Mountains of Shadow. The men of Gondor feel a great loss at the departure of Thorongil, all save Denethor. As Denethor would soon ascend to the role of steward, Aragorn spends the following years traveling to distant lands, as we are told in the Lord of the Rings appendices. And then in the hour of victory, he passed out of the knowledge of men of the West, and went alone far into the east and deep into the south, exploring the hearts of men both evil and good, and uncovering the plots and devices of the servants of Sauron. It is said that his work in these years would help ensure the survival of the West decades later during the War of the Ring. Finally, in mid-2980, Aragorn makes his way home toward Rivendell. En route, he stops for a time in Lorien, where Galadriel tells him to cast aside his wayworn raiment giving him clothes of silver and white. Aragorn now appears to be more than any kind of men, but rather an elf lord from the Isles of the West. Unbeknownst to Aragorn, Arwen is once again visiting her grandparents at this same time. The now 49-year-old mortal man once again meets the one whom he loves. They would walk together for a time in the glades of Lothlorien until it is time for Aragorn to depart. 
They come to the hill of Karen Emroth, where they look east to the shadow and west to the twilight. And Arwen said, Dark is the shadow, and yet my heart rejoices, for you, Estelle, shall be among the great whose valor will destroy it. But Aragorn answered, Alas, I cannot foresee it, and how it may come to pass is hidden from me. Yet with your hope, I will hope, and the shadow I utterly reject. But neither, lady, is the twilight for me, for I am mortal, and if you will cleave to me, even star, then the twilight you must also renounce. And she stood then as still as a white tree, looking into the west, and at last she said, I will cleave to you, Dunedain, and turn from the twilight. Together they plight their troth, and Aragorn gives to Arwen the ring of Barahir as a ring of betrothal. Aragorn returns to Rivendell, where Elrond has learned of his daughter's choice. When Elrond learned the choice of his daughter, he was silent, though his heart was grieved and found the doom long feared none the easier to endure. And when Aragorn came to Rivendell, he called him to him, and he said, My son, years come when hope will fade, and beyond them little is clear to me, and now a shadow lies between us. Maybe it has been appointed so, that by my loss the kingship of men may be restored. Therefore, though I love you, I say to you, Arwen Undomiel shall not diminish her life's grace for less cause. She shall not be the bride of any man less than the king of both Gondor and Arnor. To me then, even our victory can bring only sorrow and parting, but to you hope of joy for a while. Alas, my son, I fear that to Arwen the doom of men may seem hard at the ending. So it stood afterwards between Elrond and Aragorn, and they spoke no more of this matter. But Aragorn went forth again into danger and toil, and while the world darkened and fear fell on Middle-earth, as the power of Sauron grew and Barad-dûr rose ever taller and stronger, Arwen remained in Rivendell, and when Aragorn was abroad, from afar she watched over him in thought, and in hope she made for him a great and kingly standard, such as only one might display who claimed the lordship of the Numenorians and the inheritance of Elendil. Just over 20 years later, in 3001 of the Third Age, as Sauron continues to regain his power in Mordor, Aragorn takes on a new task, assisting Gandalf in searching for news of the creature Gollum. This is the very year of Bilbo's 111th birthday, and Gandalf has come to suspect that what is now Frodo's ring may in fact be the one. Six years later, in 3007, Aragorn returns briefly to Eriador, where he visits his mother for the last time. She tells him that it will be their last parting, saying that she cannot face the darkness that gathers upon Middle-earth, for she will leave it soon. Aragorn attempts to comfort his mother, saying there may yet be light beyond the darkness. In her final words to her son, Gilrain says, Onen i estel edain, ukebin estel anim, meaning, I gave hope to the Dúnedain. I have kept no hope for myself. Notice the first instance of Estelle is capitalized here. She did not simply give hope to the descendants of Númenor. She gave her son. And in one of my favorite deep cut moments of the films, Elrond and Aragorn recite these very words, a reference to Gilrain, the mother of Aragorn, who died seeing only the darkness that lied upon the path her son must trod. After searching intermittently for many years, Aragorn finally overtakes Gollum in the Dead Marshes in 3017. He goes north through the Emin Muil in an effort to avoid detection by Sauron's spies. He then crosses the great river Anduin at Sarn Gebir by tying Gollum to a log and swimming across the river. They proceed along the edges of Fangorn Forest and through Lothlorien. Upon their arrival, the Elves of Lorien send word to Gandalf of Gollum's capture. But Aragorn's journey is not yet complete. He and Gollum proceed along the Anduin northward, and with the help of the Beornings, they enter Mirkwood, finally coming to Thranduil's halls. He turns Gollum over to the Elven King 
to be held captive for Gandalf's interrogation. In total, Aragorn had traveled some 900 miles on foot with Gollum in tow. After this long journey, Aragorn returns to Eriador and his Dúnedain. He would next meet Gandalf at Sarn Ford in May 3018. There, Gandalf tells Aragorn of his plan for Frodo to leave the Shire bearing the ring in late September. As summer wanes and September finally comes, Aragorn learns from the elves of Gildor that Gandalf has gone missing and the Nazgul have been seen. He also learns that Frodo has left Hobbiton, but there is no news of him leaving Buckland. Aragorn anxiously watches over the East Road with his rangers, looking for signs of the ring bearer. Finally, on September 29th, four halflings enter the prancing pony in Bree, as the ranger Strider sits in the corner. After Frodo stands on a table and sings a song in an effort to prevent Pippin from revealing the story of Bilbo's disappearance, the hobbit falls and vanishes before everyone's eyes. Strider confronts Frodo about the foolishness of his actions and would meet the hobbits in their room that night. He warns them of the danger of the Black Riders, tells them that he is a friend of Gandalf, and shows them the hilt shard of Narsil, the blade that was broken. As Barlam and Butterbur delivers a letter from Gandalf he had forgotten to send to Frodo three months earlier, which supports Strider's claims, the ranger requests only that Frodo accept him as his guide to Rivendell. This results in one of the funniest exchanges in all of the Lord of the Rings. Well, you know your own business, maybe, said Butterbur, looking suspiciously at Strider. But if I was in your plight, I wouldn't take up with a ranger. Then who would you take up with? asked Strider. A fat innkeeper who only remembers his own name because people shouted at him all day? Frodo agrees to take Strider on as their guide. They head east from Bree, passing through Chetwood, the Midgewater Marshes, and the Weather Hills, arriving at Weathertop on October 6, 3018. There they find a stone with strange markings. Aragorn deduces that it is the G rune with three strokes, interpreting this to mean that Gandalf was present on Weathertop on October 3rd. That evening, they would come under attack by five of the Nazgul. The other four had gone in pursuit of Gandalf after their encounter at this very spot three nights before. After Frodo is stabbed, Aragorn drives the Nazgul away, brandishing a flaming brand of wood in either hand. Aragorn does what he can for the wounded hobbit, treating him with Ethelas after singing a slow song in Sindarin over the dagger hilt of the Nazgul. Aragorn continues to lead the hobbits toward Rivendell for the next 12 days. They encounter the three trolls from Bilbo's adventure before they come across the elf lord Glorfindel on the evening of October 18th. As they continue their journey, they are waylaid by the Nazgul on October 20th. Glorfindel sends Frodo forth on his horse, Asphaloth, while he, Aragorn, and the other hobbits come behind bearing torches, driving the Nazgul into the river Bruinen. With Frodo on the other side, the river rises against the servants of the enemy, who are swept away. Their steeds killed, they are left to return to Mordor on foot. Aragorn would then bring Frodo to Rivendell, where he is healed of his Morgul wound by Elrond. Five days later, Aragorn would attend the Council of Elrond, where he is revealed to be the heir of Elendil to the wider group. When Boromir looks upon Aragorn with doubt, Bilbo is annoyed on his friend's behalf. Suddenly standing, he bursts out, All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. Not very good, perhaps, but to the point. If you need more beyond the word of Elrond, if that was worth a journey of 110 days to hear, you had best listen to it. He sat down with a snort. And indeed, the blade that was broken would be reforged there in Rivendell. Aragorn renames it Anduril, the Flame of the West. Later, Elrond would reveal to Frodo that Aragorn was to be part of his company departing Rivendell. The original intent was that Aragorn and Boromir would travel with the Fellowship while their paths were the same. 
and that the two men would return to Gondor to assist the Kingdom of Men. Aragorn and Gandalf would spend much time together in Rivendell, speaking of their road and analyzing maps and books of lore in the House of Elrond. The Fellowship departs on December 25th, 3018, making their way south where they must choose among three paths. The Redhorn Pass over the Misty Mountains, the Lost Kingdom of Moria beneath the mountains, or the Gap of Rohan. With Saruman's treachery, the Gap of Rohan is not safe, and Aragorn encourages the group to take the Redhorn Pass. They would encounter heavy blizzards and be forced to turn back in defeat on January 12, 3019. When the option of Moria comes up once more, Aragorn notes that he had once passed through that dark realm on his own. I too once passed the Dimril Gate, said Aragorn quietly. But though I also came out again, the memory is very evil. I do not wish to enter Moria a second time. In one last effort to dissuade Gandalf, he says, You followed my lead almost to disaster in the snow, and have said no word of blame. I will follow your lead now, if this last warning does not move you. It is not of the ring nor of us others that I am thinking now, but of you, Gandalf. And I say to you, if you pass the doors of Moria, beware. Eventually, Aragorn and the rest of the company would relent to Gandalf's will to pass through Khazad Dûm after they are attacked by wolves in the early hours of January 13th. After two days of traveling the Dark Realm, Gandalf falls in his face-off with the Balrog upon the bridge of Khazad Dûm. After the company flees the mountain and weeps for the loss of Gandalf, Aragorn would lead them onward. Alas, I feel we cannot stay here longer said Aragorn. He looked toward the mountains and held up his sword. Farewell, Gandalf, he cried. Did I not say to you if you pass the doors of Moria, beware? Alas, that I spoke true. What hope have we without you? He turned to the company. We must do without hope, he said. At least we may yet be avenged. Let us gird ourselves and weep no more. Come, we have a long road and much to do. Aragorn leads the Fellowship to Lothlorien, where they would eventually come to Karas Galathon and meet Celeborn and Galadriel. The rest of the company is amazed at Aragorn's friendship with the elves of this incredible realm. They would remain in Lorien for one month, leaving on February 16, 3019. Before their departure, Galadriel would bestow gifts upon the Fellowship. To Aragorn, she gives the Elf Stone serving as a wedding gift from the bride's family to the groom. This green gem would be worn by Aragorn ever after, fulfilling the prediction of his grandmother so many years ago. And indeed, Aragorn would take his royal name of Elisar from this very gem. For a week, the Fellowship travels by boat down the Anduin River, surviving a brief attack on February 23rd before passing the Argonath, the great pillars of the kings, on February 25th. Fear not, said a strange voice behind him. Frodo turned and saw Strider, and yet not Strider, for the weather-worn ranger was no longer there. In the stern sat Aragorn, son of Arathorn, proud and erect, guiding the boat with skillful strokes. His hood was cast back, and his dark hair was blowing in the wind, a light was in his eyes, a king, returning from exile to his own land. Fear not, he said. Long have I desired to look upon the likenesses of Isildur and Anarion, my sires of old. Under their shadow, Elisar, the elf stone son of Arathorn of the house of Valendil, Isildur's son, heir of Elendil, has naught to dread. Despite his majestic appearance in Frodo's eyes, there is still great doubt in Aragorn's mind. While he wishes to go with Boromir to Minas Tirith, he now feels that with Gandalf fallen, he should accompany the Ringbearer wherever he should go. The following day, the company is attacked by orcs at Amon Hen. In the tumult, the four hobbits are lost, and Aragorn finds a mortally wounded Boromir, pierced with many arrows. Boromir tells Aragorn that the orcs took the halflings captive, and says, Farewell, Aragorn. Go to Minas Tirith and save my people. I have failed. No, said Aragorn. 
taking his hand and kissing his brow. You have conquered. Few have gained such a victory. Be at peace. Minas Tirith shall not fall. Boromir smiled. Which way did they go? Was Frodo there? Said Aragorn. But Boromir did not speak again. Alas, said Aragorn. Thus passes the heir of Denethor, lord of the Tower of God. This is a bitter end. Now the company is all in ruin. It is I that have failed. Vain was Gandalf's trust in me. What shall I do now? Boromir has laid it on me to go to Minas Tirith, and my heart desires it. But where are the ring and the bearer? How shall I find them and save this quest from disaster? Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli place Boromir in one of the elven boats, his broken horn and sword across his lap, and the weapons of his vanquished foes at his feet. Singing a lament for Boromir, they set his funeral boat adrift in the Anduin, which would carry his body over the falls of Rauros and far beyond. Aragorn is able to discern that not only was Frodo not a captive of the orcs, but that he had taken the other elven boat across the river along with Sam. Finally, resolved in his decision, he, Gimli, and Legolas, the three hunters, speed through the trees, tireless and swift. Pursuing the orcs, they pass away, gray shadows in a stony land. The three hunters make their way across the western portion of Rohan, following the orcs toward Fangorn Forest. Just over three days after leaving Amon Hen, they encounter Eomer on February 30th. Eomer is amazed to find they had traveled 45 leagues in just three days. Aragorn and Eomer form an easy friendship, each sensing the honesty and lordliness in the other. Rather than taking the intruders of Rohan captive, Eomer gives them horses, with Aragorn promising to return to Edoras. Aragorn would go on in an attempt to track the footsteps of Merry and Pippin, coming to Fangorn Forest itself. There, on March 1st, Aragorn's 89th birthday, they would not find the halflings, but a resurrected Gandalf the White. Aragorn accompanies the wizard to Edoras, fulfilling his promise to Eomer. After Gandalf heals Theoden, Aragorn would ride once more with a king of Rohan, as they march to war with Saruman. After the retreating force from the Fords of Aizen tells them of Saruman's force marching towards them, the group makes for Helm's Deep. There, alongside Eomer, Aragorn would lead the men of Rohan in the defense of the Hornburg. They would hold out through the night of March 3rd into the morning of March 4th, when Gandalf arrives with Urkenbrand, turning the tide of battle and with the help of the Huorns, utterly destroying Saruman's forces. Aragorn would go with Theoden, Gandalf, and the others to Isengard, where they would parley with Saruman, now a captive in his own tower, thanks to the Ents. That night, Pippin would look into the Palantir of Isengard. Gandalf would then resolve to take Pippin, who Sauron believed to be the Ringbearer, to Minas Tirith. Before departing, he gives to Aragorn the Palantir, for it belongs to him by right as the heir of Elendil. The following day, Aragorn looks into the Palantir in an effort to strike a blow to the heart of Sauron. Sauron has not forgotten Isildur and the sword of Elendil. Now in the very hour of his great designs, the heir of Isildur and the sword are revealed, for I showed the blade reforged to him. He is not so mighty yet that he is above fear. Nay, doubt ever gnaws him. While Gimli points out that now aware of Aragorn, Sauron will strike more swiftly. Aragorn replies, the hasty stroke goes oft astray. He resolves that they must press the enemy. Aragorn is joined by the Grey Company, consisting of not only Dúnedain rangers of the north, but his old friends Elidan and Elrohir, the sons of Elrond. They bring to him a gift from the Lady Arwen, to be brought out in the coming days. As they arrive at Dunharrow, where the Rohirrim will muster their forces, Eowyn would reveal that she loved Aragorn. However, Aragorn would refuse to take her on the dark road that lay before him. As he would later state, it was only a shadow and a thought that she loved. Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, and the Grey Company take the Paths of the Dead on March 8th. 
reaching the Stone of Erek on the other side of the mountains at midnight. He summons the Oathbreakers, the dead men of Dunharrow, cursed for thousands of years for their betrayal of Gondor in the days of Isildur. Over the next three days, Aragorn makes his way through the southern fiefs of Gondor, coming to Kalimbel, then on the dawnless day crossing the Ringlo, and going on into Lebanon on March 11th. On March 12th, Aragorn, his company, and the dead men drive the invading Corsairs back to Pelargir, and the following day he captures their fleet. Unlike his encounter decades earlier, Aragorn would have little need for his sword, for that great weapon of the enemy was now used against his own servants. Fear. To every ship they came that was drawn up, and then they passed over the water to those that were anchored, and all the mariners were filled with a madness of terror and leaped overboard, save the slaves chained to the oars. Reckless we rode among our fleeing foes, driving them like leaves until we came to the shore. And then to each of the great ships that remained, Aragorn sent one of the Dúnedain, and they comforted the captives that were aboard and bade them put aside fear and be free. Aragorn takes the Corsair vessels up the great river to Minas Tirith, and Arwen's gift is unfurled as they come to land, the great standard of Alendil, showing Eomer fighting on the Pelennor that doom had not come. Instead, the king had returned. Sauron's forces crumbled, and the men of the west are victorious. Furling his banner, Aragorn appoints Imrahil the temporary lord of the city, as Denethor was now dead, and Faramir yet lay afflicted in the Houses of Healing. While refusing to enter the city so as not to appear to be seizing power, he would later sneak into Minas Tirith, where he would heal Faramir, Eowyn, and Mary, fulfilling the prophecy, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer, and so shall the rightful king be known. Aragorn would work long into the night, healing more and more people as word spread. When the people of the city awoke the next morning, they saw the banner of Dol Amroth, for Imrahil had taken his place as temporary lord, leading the people to wonder if the king's return had been a dream. Aragorn holds a last debate with his most trusted leaders, including Gandalf, Eomer, Gimli, Legolas, Eladan, Elrohir, and Imrahil. At Gandalf's behest, they come to the conclusion they must draw the forces of Mordor forth in an effort to give Frodo easier passage across the desolate lands. On March 18th, the host of the West marches from Minas Tirith, coming to the Morgul Vale the following day. After a further four days of travel, as they leave Ithilien and draw closer to Mordor, Aragorn dismisses those who had become faint-hearted from the terror that lie around and before them. He tasks them with the retaking of Caer Andros, showing both resolve and mercy. They come to the Black Gate on March 25th, where they come face to face with the mouth of Sauron. Is there anyone in this route with authority to treat with me? He asked. Or indeed with wit to understand me? Not thou at least, he mocked, turning to Aragorn with scorn. It needs more to make a king than a piece of elvish glass, or a rabble such as this. Why, any brigand of the hills can show as good a following. Aragorn said not in answer, but he took the other's eye and held it. And for a moment they strove thus, but soon, though Aragorn did not stir, nor move hand to weapon, the other quailed and gave back as if menaced with a blow. I am a herald and ambassador and may not be assailed, he cried. Aragorn's mere gaze strikes fear into the heart of the mouth of Sauron, at the very gate of Mordor. Yet Aragorn's life would not be in his own hands, but in the hands of two halflings and that of fate. The ring is destroyed at the cracks of doom, and after the ring bearers are rescued by the great eagles, Aragorn would heal Frodo and Sam at the field of Cormalin, bringing them back from the very brink of death. In the aftermath of the Battle of the Black Gate, Aragorn pardons all the Easterlings who had given themselves up and sends them away free. 
Aragorn would return to Minas Tirith victorious, and on May 1st, 3019, he would be crowned King of Gondor, with Faramir announcing his return to the people. Men of Gondor, hear now the steward of this realm. Behold, one has come to claim the kingship at last. Here is Aragorn, son of Arathorn, chieftain of the Dúnedain of Arnor, captain of the host of the west, bearer of the star of the north, wielder of the sword reforged, victorious in battle, whose hands bring healing, the elf stone, Elisar of the line of Valendil, Isildur's son, Elendil's son of Númenor. In one of his first moves as king, Aragorn would not only have Faramir keep the role of steward, but appoint him Prince of Ithilien and Lord of Emin Arnen. Despite the defeat of Sauron and his becoming king against all hope, Aragorn is still troubled, fearing his wish to marry Arwen would not be granted. On June 25th, Gandalf speaks with Aragorn, saying, The Third Age was my age. I was the enemy of Sauron, and my work is finished. I shall go soon. The burden must now lie upon you and your kindred. But I shall die, said Aragorn, for I am a mortal man, and though being what I am, and of the race of the West unmingled, I too shall grow old. And who then shall govern Gondor, and those who look to this city as to their queen, if my desire be not granted? The tree in the court of the fountain is still withered and barren. When shall I see a sign that it will ever be otherwise? Turn your face from the green world, and look where all seems barren and cold," said Gandalf. Thus Aragorn finds upon the slopes of Mount Mindoluin a sapling of Nimloth, and the white tree would grow in Minas Tirith once more. Despite his worries, Elrond and Arwen would indeed come to Gondor arriving around June 30th, 3019. Elrond finally presents to Aragorn the scepter of Anuminas, signifying the kingship of Arnor. On Midsummer's Day, Aragorn and Arwen are wed, and the reunited kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor have both a king and a queen. On July 22nd, Aragorn sets out with the remaining members of the Fellowship and many others as part of the funeral escort of King Theoden. On the way, they stop at the Greywood under Amondin, where he declares the forest of the Druidain officially to belong to Gonborigon and his people, and that none shall enter it without their leave. On August 10th, a funeral is held for King Theoden in Edoras. They would leave four days later, bidding farewell to Eomer and the newly betrothed Eowyn and Faramir. On August 18th, they stop at Helm's Deep, before moving on their way and arriving at Isengard on August 22nd. It is here that the Fellowship would come to its end. Never again would all eight remaining members be together. For Aragorn's part, he would receive the keys of Orthanc from Treebeard, and while he would order the restoration of the Tower and the return of the Palantir, he would declare the realm of Isengard to be an Entish realm, known afterward as the Treegarth of Orthanc. Within the tower during its restoration, they would discover the original Elendilmere, the star of Elendil which Isildur had worn when he was slain. Returning to Minas Tirith, Aragorn would re-establish the Great Council of Gondor. Chief among the king's counselors is his steward, Faramir. With Eomer, he would renew the oaths of Kirion and Eorl, swearing unending allegiance between their kingdoms. It is said in the early years of Aragorn's reign, Eomer would often fulfill his oath. While Southrons in the lands of Harad would come to make peace with and submit to the rule of King Elisar, and come to send embassies to Minas Tirith, the East would not so easily move beyond the influence of Sauron. The East was not only a frequent hiding place and focus of Sauron for hundreds of years at a time, it was also a major focus for Morgoth in ancient days. While we know that not all Easterlings were loyal to Sauron, there would be remnants that would remain hostile to Gondor. As Tolkien states, for though Sauron had passed, the hatreds and evils that he bred had not died, and the King of the West had many enemies to subdue before the White Tree could grow in peace. And wherever King Elisar went with war, King Eomer went with him. And beyond the Sea of Rune, 
and on the far fields of the south, the thunder of the cavalry of the mark was heard, and white horse upon green flew in many winds until Eomer grew old. Together, these great kings of the west would make safe their kingdoms for generations to come. Thankfully, the final meeting of the Fellowship would not be the last time Aragorn would see many of his friends. In the year 15 of the Fourth Age, 17 years into his reign, Aragorn and Arwen visit the hobbits outside the Shire at the Brandywine Bridge. There he appoints the offices of Thane of the Shire, Mayor of Mickledelving, and Master of Buckland to be counselors of the North Kingdom the very offices now held by Pippin, Sam, and Mary, respectively. He also decrees that no one shall enter the lands of the Shire without the leave of the Hobbits, and further extends the Shire to the Emin Bared. We also learn that Legolas would bring a group of elves out of Greenwood in the year 20 of the Fourth Age, to dwell in Ithilien, which once again becomes the fairest country in all the Westlands. Both these elves and Gimli's dwarves of the Glittering Caves would assist in the restoration of Minas Tirith, with the dwarves specifically rebuilding the gates of Minas Tirith with mithril and steel. Merry and Pippin would also make a return to Gondor, after spending Eomer's last days with him in Edoras in the fall of the year 63. The two friends come to Minas Tirith. Pippin brings with him a copy of the Red Book of Westmarch, which Aragorn had requested. In Minas Tirith, they would spend the remaining few years with Aragorn. Upon their deaths, they are laid to rest in Rath Dinan, the burial place of the kings and stewards of Gondor. King Elisar would die over 50 years after Merry and Pippin, on March 1st, 120 of the Fourth Age. At 210 years of age, he had ruled over the reunited kingdom for 122 years. When his body is placed in Rath Dinan, Merry and Pippins are placed beside him. Most significantly, Aragorn voluntarily lays down his life when his time has come, a practice of the great kings of Numenor of old, who embraced the gift of men rather than resented it. After her husband's death, Arwen would lay down her mortal life in Lothlorien, upon the very hill of Karen Emroth, where she and Aragorn had professed their love for one another. As for Aragorn and Arwen's children, there would be one son, Eldarion, his heir, and at least two daughters. These children would be the first descendants of the royal house of Telkontar, this great and noble line founded with the returning king, whose hands brought healing, who won great renown in war, and saw the downfall of Sauron, is translated from Telkontar in Quenya to the common tongue. Strider. Now being resourceful is why I love the survival belt from Slide Belts. Not only does this belt feature an LED flashlight for dark moments, but also a stainless steel knife, a fire starter, and a bottle opener, combined with the convenience of Slide Belts ratcheting buckle. And right now you can save 20% off your order just by using the code Nerd of the Rings. For some of the best belts you'll ever find, go to slidebelts.com. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, The Mighty Mim, Andrew Carlisle, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Micah Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.